Okay, so my name is Diane um, from the Park City Museum, um, and we welcome you tonight. Um, we're very excited to have you. Um, I just want to tell you that we do have a Jacob Reese exhibit. Um, we do have a Jacob Reese exhibit, and uh, we are um, going to have that to January 7th. And so uh, please feel free to come to the museum yeah. to see the exhibit. Um, because, you know, we, uh, we're very excited to have it in here. And it's called um, Jacob A. Reese, How the Other Half Lives. And it's all about him being a photographer and um, taking uh, pictures of uh, people who were in the slums. And uh, it's actually very interesting. So uh, please feel free to come to the museum and, and see the, the um, new exhibit that we have. And like I said, it'll be here till January 7th. Uh, we usually clear out before Sundance, and, um, and that's what our typical schedule is. So, so anyway, um, okay, I'm going to introduce Matt, and then I'll have Matt take over. Um, Matt Basso is an Associate Professor of History and Gender Studies at the University of Utah. His research in interests include the theory and history of masculinity, labor, and working class history, the history of old age, the history You're of race, not, there's something up right here. ethnicity, um, the relationship of military to the society, U.S. Western history, the history of Pacific settler societies, and transnational history. He offers courses that grapple with all of these subjects. He is also the author or editor of four books. Basso is a distinguished lecturer of the Organization of American Historians and the recipient of the U University of Utah sure Distinguished Teaching the, Award. The reverse thing? Remember? And, um, and a postdoctoral mentor award, public service professionalship, and honors humanities professorship. He is working on a new history of the World War II home front for the National Park Service and finishing a book on New Zealand history between 1890 and 1940. And I'm going to ask everyone if you could stay on mute. If you have anything to say or you have any questions, just put it in the chat and I'll ask Matt at the end. Um, sometimes the the noise uh, from the backgrounds can uh, disturb the, everybody's hearing, so we want to make sure that we're able to hear and understand him. And this way, we'll answer all of your questions at the end. All right. Uh, so, without further ado, Matt, if you'd like to take over, and I will admit people as we go along. So awesome. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking an hour or so out of a Thursday evening during these strange times um, to talk about uh, an intriguing subject, I hope. Um, this is about Jacob Rees, uh, as you well know. But what I'd like to do with you is to talk about Rees's connection to more contemporary times, and in fact, to trace an arc, if you will, from Rees to our contemporary moment through something that I and others call the documentary impulse. Okay, so this is um, a photograph, a uh, famous photograph that Jacob Reese took uh, of um, some men sleeping within uh, a boarding house. You can see the uh, incredibly rough conditions, uh, people stacked on top of each other, stacked on top of wood and so on and so forth. And I'm gonna say a bit more about what Reese was doing and why he was doing it, because it's important to our story. But next to it, you'll see that uh, beautiful Airstream. Uh, this is one of the StoryCorps Airstream buses, that uh, RVs that go around the United States and record um, stories, right? I hope you've heard of StoryCorps. It's a major part of the uh, of, uh, uh, National Public Radio. Um, it's a very cool project. And I'm gonna be saying more about it uh, in a couple of moments. What I want to do is talk about the connections between StoryCorps, which I'm going to argue is really kind of an emblematic example of the documentary impulse in our current moment, and Jacob Rees, right? This remarkable uh, figure from um, the late 19th century. All right, here's Rees in his own words. I was a writer and a newspaper man, and I only yelled about the conditions which I saw. My share in the work of the slums has been that. I have not had a 10,000th part in the fight, but I have been in it. Now, Reese is uh, being very modest. Um, Reese was an incredibly important um, muckraker. This is the term that we use for 
uh, that era's journalists who went above and beyond to try to understand and expose the problems of the progressive era. Reese did it in a really novel set of ways. And you should know the full range, they're pretty fascinating. He wasn't just a reporter, which he's famous for. He wasn't just a photographer, but he was a lecturer and a book writer and an activist in many, many other sort of realms. You can learn about this, and I'll show you in a second, through the Library of Congress's really excellent uh, page and exhibit on Reese. Reese's most famous work without question is the very title of this exhibit, right? How the Other Half, half Lives. The subtitle is Studies Among the Tenements of New York. It comes out in 1890 in book form, but it's published prior to that, uh, serialized in Scrivener's, a uh, very important magazine of the era around Christmas time uh, in the late 1880s. And what Reese does is from his police beat, he was a police reporter, he starts to report about the lives of immigrants in these very difficult circumstances, both at work and at rest in New York's tenements. Here's the page I was talking to you about. Um, if you're interested, you can take a look at the Library of Congress. Just Google Library of Congress and Jacob Reese, and this will come up for you. And it's got a bunch of fantastic links about Reese's life and each of the components of the type of documentary effort he made to track the problems of the progressive era. Now, the problems of the progressive era, um, at least the way we teach it at, at the university, are encapsulated by three different areas primarily, industrialization, immigration, and urbanization, okay? The progressives believed that experts, you remember those experts? Um, that experts uh, could in fact apply their knowledge and skills and change society. They could do it through advocating for certain policies, but first they would research those policies. And then as they advocated, they would illuminate the problems of modern society. And I'm here to tell you the progressive era in the United States, the late 19th century into the 20th century had an enormous number of problems. Industrialization brought a huge number of immigrants to the United States, both in a pull, that is to say American industry needed more workers and in a push from their home countries where there really wasn't enough work, especially in regard to modernity and sort of the transnational flows of products and peoples. So industrialization brings a ton of immigrants in, primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe. That's the era of industrialization we're talking about. Prior to that, it was Germans and there was many Irish, as well as Northern Europeans and, and so on. Happy to talk more about that in Q&A if you wish. Immigration and immigrants primarily grouped in cities and it's that dynamic that Reese was really trying to expose right? He wanted to show that when this happened without good planning and without a good infrastructure, there was enormous problems for these people, right? For these immigrants that were working in these tenements, in these slums. Reese was among a number of other very prominent muckrakers, the most famous of which was Upton Sinclair. Here I've got one of many covers of, of Sinclair's uh, very famous, very important study called The Jungle. Uh, Sinclair and these other muckrakers exposed the problems of the progressive era for a broader audience. And as they did so, they did make change. This is what Reese wanted to do, right? He didn't want to just take photographs. He didn't want to just report. He wanted to change things. He was an activist, okay? And his mode of activism was documenting the lives of immigrants in particular as they struggled with this tripartite set of problems, industrialization, immigration, and urbanization, and how America was reacting to it. Same thing for, for uh, Sinclair. All right. Now I want to shift us to the uh, next era. Uh, I apologize. I've got a problem here with my um, audio. I want to shift us to the next era here, and this is um, the Great Depression, which follows on from the Progressive Era and the 1920s. The Great Depression is especially important to my story. Remember, I'm trying to trace from Reese all the way to contemporary times to this thing I call the documentary impulse. 
The documentary impulse is this effort to document the lives of ordinary Americans, right? And the question is, why? What do we do this for? The answer for Reese, as I just noticed, was very clear. Reese wanted to document ordinary lives to make change, right? And to show policymakers and Americans that were better off exactly how challenging the lives were of other ordinary Americans, the working class, immigrants, and so on. In the Great Depression, we see both an expansion of this documentary impulse, a massive expansion, by the way, as you're about to see, and a shift in the way the documentary impulse takes place. So 1930s culture for the first time, popular culture is dominated by ordinary people. And that's because of the Great Depression, right? It's ordinary people that Franklin Delano Roosevelt speaks to. It's these ordinary forgotten Americans that he wants to champion and lift up. But that same thing happens in popular culture. Instead of the elite culture that dominated popular culture in many ways prior to that, talking about opera and fine art and that sort of thing, now it's about workers and ordinary people. And you see that in very virtually every medium. Uh, film is incredibly popular during the Great Depression. So you can think of films like Frank Capra's films. You can also think of documentary film like Per Lorenz's remarkable The Plow That Broke the Plains. Here's an image. If you haven't seen The Plow That Broke the Plains, very, very worthwhile. And you'll note that I've said Per Lorenz in the title and the FSA. The FSA is the Farm Security Administration. Excuse me, my slides want to keep on going. The FSA is the Farm Security Administration, and it's one of the New Deal organizations that um, sponsored this documentary impulse. So Per Lorenz, by the way, uh, wins numerous awards for this, including, um, and for his other documentaries, uh, including a, a, a Pulitzer Prize. Um, quite, quite remarkable. So the documentary impulse then, vis-a-vis -vis Lorenz and people like uh, Dorothea Lange and Woody Guthrie and the writing of Richard Wright, it, it's not just an impulse at this point, it's, it's a form of art. And it's absolutely central to the art of the 1930s. But herein is where we start to have some disagreements among practitioners who document everyday life about what it's for and what it's all about. Uh, a beautiful photograph, so many beautiful photographs from, from the 1930s, um, really just a, a marvelous age for art. Most of you will have seen this image, I hope. Uh, this is one of Dorothea Lange's most famous images, if not most famous image. This is uh, her migrant mother. What do you got there? Um, you'll notice that that machine kills fascists. Uh, we could use that machine right now. Um, anyway, uh, Guthrie, another one of these uh, very important um, artists of the 1930s, and I'm trying to illustrate how the documentary impulse really went across many different mediums. And of course, uh, the remarkable Richard Wright. Uh, Wright, um, 12 Million Black Voices, a book you probably haven't heard of from him, uh, is both a combination of photographs and brief textual narratives about the lives of ordinary African Americans. Uh, it was a big deal uh, in the 1930s and is emblematic of this. My computer is just wanting to go up, go on its own. Um, all of this is uh, very much um, part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's vision for, for the United States. Um, and when I say that, um, what I'm saying is that, sorry, I'm gonna go backwards. Uh, my um, computer is is got a mind of its own, so it's going to be intriguing how this goes forward. Uh, so Roosevelt's um, promise to the American people is to try to save them from this disastrous Great Depression, and he wants to do that for artists as well. Uh, he does that especially in what we call the Second New Deal, when a wider program emerges that's related to what we call the WPA. Um, the WPA. Uh, the Second New Deal um, famously puts artists to work in a bunch of different areas, uh, and that includes theater, that includes music, and that includes um, writing, uh, famously the, the Writers Project. As they do so, their goal is to document the life of, of Americans. Okay? This is a big part of the American zeitgeist in the 1930s is to try to get a sense of what America is really all about, what its unique um, 
what's unique about it and how it's ordinary Americans live their, live their lives. Here's um, a couple of different posters from both uh, from the arts, music, and theater programs, more on the writing program here in just a second. All of these combined were called Federal One. They employed, you know, only around 30,000 of 8.5 million people that were employed by the WPA, but they were incredibly influential uh, in many, many different ways. Um, and they're adjacent to things like the CCC, uh, which built many parks for us, uh, did big uh, infrastructure projects and so on and so forth. Here are some of the famous alums of the Federal Writers Project. Uh, Ralph Ellison, Saul Below, Zora Neale Hurston, Louis L'Amour, and Jim Thompson, um, all remarkable writers of different genres, all of them, all of them employed by the federal government during the 1930s to capture people's lives. Part of that remarkable documentary impulse that really comes to dominate the 1930s. Here's a picture of rank and file writers, the less famous, and the Nebraska State Project Office. Okay, these folks were busy creating, um, documenting the lives of ordinary Nebraskans and creating this thing. That's the Federal Writers Project State Guides. Uh, this is a poster of about the state guides. The state guides for every state, the Utah one is wonderful, by the way, uh, were produced by the Federal Writers Project, and they're just a compendium of really interesting aspects of ordinary people's lives, as well as the broader story of these states, their geography, and so on. Uh, these were very much sought after and heralded by uh, ordinary folks and um, literary critics of, of the time. Here's a picture of the web page you can find at the Library of Congress for the Federal Writers Project's Folklore Project. And it's this that I really want to zoom in on as part of the documentary impulse. Ordinary folks, some trained by the Federal Writers Project, some not really all that trained at all, went out into communities and took interviews, okay? We call them now oral histories or life histories. They call them life histories at the time. They're all available at the Library of Congress. Some of them are streaming uh, through the internet. You can listen to them. And the most famous part of this collection, there's thousands of these. The most famous part of this collection was the interviews done with former slaves. Here you see a picture of two of the former slaves that were interviewed. And then you also see a folk folklore worker doing an interview and recording uh, music. I think this is in Appalachia, um, which was part of kind of this bedrock effort to document America. Now you can get a sense if you're thinking about this, that we're seeing a shift in some ways from what Jacob Reese was doing with his documentary impulse, his effort to change policy and what's going on here. These stories undergirded people's sense of themselves and their community and the needs of that community. But they were also part of an archive that was meant for the future and for the moment to kind of record a different America. That's a slightly different impulse than what Reese was after. And of course, it's much more widespread in the, in the Great Depression. It happens at a bunch of different genre levels, but it happens across the country with many, many different workers. An incredibly fascinating project that does not last for very long. By the 1938, only three years really into the Second New Deal, the Republicans in Congress are after this uh, Federal Writers Project and the other parts of Federal One because they believe it's a propaganda arm for FDR. And they cut funding to it, except for they leave some funding. You can see I ask you a question there at the bottom. Is this the end of the, of the arts programs? They leave some funding at the state level, right? This is states' rights kind of stuff. And it's so that the states can finish, finish projects, including those state guides. But in many ways, this heralds the end of the Federal Writers Project as an artistic endeavor, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Music Project. Those folks go on and do different kinds of work, sometimes for the government, sometimes not. But that documentary impulse is locked in with all the remarkable stuff that they were able to pull off. Within that documentary impulse of the 1930s, and this is important, an argument emerges about what the purpose of documenting people's lives, work experiences, and other conditions really is. There's two competing visions. 
One is about politics. Okay, this is a more left-leaning vision. It says writers need to be writing in a political way to make change by changing people's sense of America as a place and the possibilities of change through government and through organized labor and through just simply changing the way we relate to each other. Okay. The second one, which has some of these, the same kind of feeling, and it can get murky between these two, it's not cut and dry, but the second major impulse is that the documentary impulse should be about art. That when you start to record people's lives, whether you do it through music or through fine art or through, sorry about that, again, that's my crazy computer, through um, writing, whatever you're doing, you really need to think about the artistic quality of what you're trying to pull off. Right, um, and that that really had a very strong backing among the artists of the 1930s. It's a different idea of the documentary impulse, and it's quite different than Reese. Right, I mean, he was trying to make good photo photographs, but it's really about making change for him. So now you're seeing a real evolution and a split within the documentary impulse, and it comes out of that most radical, at least of American decades, arguably the 1930s, which is super intriguing. So what happens afterwards? Well, first I wanna tell you about a book I wrote. Um, this is a book called Men at Work, which I discovered in the Library of Congress. Um, and it's a lost, though now found, um, relic, if you will, of the bridge between the 1930s and the post-war. It's edited by a man named Harold Rosenberg. I came back and edited it later. I'm gonna say more about Rosenberg here in one second. But what it does is it tries to take the story of ordinary workers and make that writing into art. It gives the actual practitioners of that writing creative license to try to create something new. This is what Rosenberg wanted. So Rosenberg argues in the post-war where he becomes a very important art critic, okay, a major, major art critic, that the documentary impulse is a good thing except for when it's tied to politics and it needs to be about art. Ordinary people and recording ordinary life is something that artists should be interested in, but they shouldn't try to do it realistically necessarily. They shouldn't try to just document. They should try to create art. And you can see this for those of you that know a little bit about Rosenberg in his evolution as an art critic, a very important figure in the post-war. Yet there's three other aspects of the documentary impulse that I want you to think about. And if my computer goes crazy and moves us forward, I'm gonna come back to this because they're important. I wanna to argue to you that there are four documentary impulses, competing visions coming out of World War II, but really out of the Great Depression. One is the one I just mentioned, tied to Harold Rosenberg and his um, partisan review is what we call the magazine of the 1930s, view on art as aesthetically important, uh, the documentary impulse. The next, and these next three, I'm gonna tie to a, they, they happen in other arts too, but I'm gonna tie to another one of Reese's skills, and that's interviewing. And here I'm gonna start talking about oral history, because I think it's such an important and interesting case study with the documentary impulse. And of course it ties into where I'm trying to take us, and that is StoryCorps, okay? so. The other three aspects of this documentary impulse, Alan Nevins, uh, which are gonna, you're gonna hear more about him in a moment, a very important historian at Columbia University, starts to use this documentary impulse as primarily an archival tool. So that comes out of the 1930s, but he wants to archive and document American life, and he wants to do it in a particular way. Next, there still is a lingering practice that's political but this is a little bit different. It's an activist practice, and it's tied especially to an absolutely amazing place called the Highlander School. If you haven't heard about Highlander, you should. Um, it's really remarkable. So mo more on it in one second. And then lastly, one of my heroes, Studs Terkel. I want to tie this to the remarkable oral historian, Studs Terkel, as a way of taking the documentary impulse to hear the voices of ordinary Americans, which is also a 1930s kind of thing too. So these are three or four different tracks that come out of the 1930s. Let's talk more about them, all right? There he is. Uh, Rosenberg, 
once again, um, I've already talked about this documentary impulse with the art, so I'm going to push past him, but this, this remains an important influence. This is Alan Nevins, who was a, um, also came out of the urban scene that Reese did. In fact, he kind of takes the baton for Reese in some ways. He starts up in um, New York City in 1913 and um, becomes a reporter on the same kind of beats in some ways that, that Reese had, but he uh, takes that journalistic impulse and he starts to write history. That's what he's most interested. He, and he joins Columbia faculty in 1928, writes a ton of very important books. In 1939, he takes on a very important chair at Columbia. And then after the war in 1948, he starts Columbia's very famous, very influential oral history program. And he believes that oral history is important because it can document, this is what he says, it can document the unwritten part of people's lives. He's worried about the telephone, okay? He's worried about famous figures who are gonna start to leave less of a written record, either through memoirs or keeping their own notes or lettering, right, through correspondence. And so he decides he wants to inter introduce oral history, interviewing into the historical archive and founds this very important, very influential Columbia oral history project. More on it in a second. Miles Horton, Septim Clark, and the Highlander School. So. Miles Horton comes out of the 1930s as well. He's a very um, religious man, but he sees through the challenges of the Great Depression a need for an activist religion. And what he does is he trains as a sociologist in Chicago under Robert Park, very important figure at the University of Chicago, but he also goes to Scandinavia and learns about their folklore modes. And he decides that what he wants to do is to start a school that can help train activists, and he starts with labor activists, to be better organizers by learning how to do folklore and how to do organizing by telling ordinary people's lives and listening to their experiences. That impulse gets taken up by a remarkable figure of the civil rights movement who perhaps you've heard of, but probably haven't, Septima Clark. Clark starts freedom schools in, um, the civil rights era, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, to train ordinary folks on how to, how to make change, right? And to make change by listening to other ordinary folks and what their problems are and how they wanna make change, okay? So here's a perfect quote that encapsulates this. And I'm gonna give you a second to read this, but I'm gonna read it out loud for those of you that might not be able to, to see it. This is from Miles Horton. Again, the founder of the Highlander School, which is in Appalachia, by the way, from Tennessee. And here's what Horton says. People know the basic answers to their problems, but they need to go further than that. And you can, by asking questions and getting them stimulated, coax them to move in discussion beyond their experience. And when you begin to expand the experience and share your own, people will ask each other questions. If you listen to people and work from what they tell you, within a few days, their ideas get bigger and bigger. They go back in time, right? Back in time, oral history, ahead in their imagination. You just continue to build on people's own experience. It is the basis for their learning. Now, Highlander, Septima Clark, and the Civil Rights Movement becomes a hidden activist strain that courses through the rest of the 20th century into the 21st century. And it echoes in a new way what Reese is trying to do to make change through the documentary impulse. So keep track of these folks. We're gonna come back to them as well. Studs Terkel. Uh, I hope you've heard of Studs Terkel. He's a monumental figure of the 20th century. Uh, died in 2008 uh, at the ripe age of 96. Turkle begins in the Great Depression as a jazz DJ in Chicago, and he has an ear and an interest in ordinary people's lives. 
uh, especially in an area of Chicago outside of the University of Chicago called Bug House Square, a uh, very important place for, for activists and ordinary rabble rousers that want to kind of get their views put out there. So Turkle, um, through his radio show in Chicago, starts to morph that radio show into interviews, especially with jazz legends and jazz greats. And he takes those interviews and he produces a book called The Giants of Jazz. That book eventually gets the attention of, and Turkle's interviews of publishers, and he publishes this remarkable book about ordinary people and their experiences with life called Division Street America. Division Streets in Chicago, it's the breakout book for Turkle, but you probably know him better for books like Hard Times, which is about the Great Depression, right? And about the experience of the Great Depression. It's interviews, it's oral histories, right? Or especially Working the Good War, which wins him the Pulitzer Prize, and his remarkable book on race relations in America called Simply Race. Turkle publishes much more, but he becomes um, an absolute kind of national legend. And it's through this oral history practice where he takes ordinary people's lives and projects them up for all of us so we can hear people's voices. But does he do it to make change? Does he do it like Jacob Reese? Or is he simply kind of archiving and documenting? This is gonna be important, right? Because I want you to think about what the documentary impulse, what Reese is all about and where we've gone. Again, I think Turkle's amazing and I teach him all the time. And I think maybe he does make change, but I want you to think about it, what those kind of interviews uh, provide. You'll see that I note that he's a genius at finding good people to interview. He's got an easygoing rapport and he kind of improvises. It's almost like his own love for jazz. So from these roots, from these four different strains of the documentary impulse, we get into the 1960s people's movement and out of these people's movements and out of these four strains emerges the academic practice of oral history. And this is more or less ordinary folks who go into the academy, become historians, and they want to get at ordinary people's lives and they decide the way to do that since often you don't find them in textbooks or in many written records is to do oral histories. Oral histories absolutely explode from this moment, right? We have small oral history projects all over this country that tell the history of workers, that tell women's history, that tell the history of communities of color that have been marginalized. And it's through this practice in the 1960s that a bunch of trained historians take oral history into universities and then train a bunch more of oral historians. This is what I do. I train my students in oral history because I think it's a fabulously important skill that's transferable to a bunch of different jobs, right? Not just being a historian at the university, but learning about people, talking to people, getting more deeply into their lives, and then doing things from that new knowledge base. So out of the 1960s people's movements, out of this uh, emergence of oral history, we start to see um, an oral history practice in universities that ends up having several tensions. First off, many people in universities don't think that ordinary people's lives are all that interesting or important. And oral historians have to fight against that and against their own marginalization. They do that by making this kind of its own field, its own discipline with its own theory and methods. As they do that, they have to push against people that say people's memories, the people that you're interviewing their memories are wrong. Now, oral historians, call this the truth problem, right? This is a question of what do we do with people's memories and are they actually being truthful? And what oral historians end up arguing through a deep kind of theoretical take is that that is a certain version of truth and a, a, it's a version of truth that's important to ordinary people. It's a collective memory sometimes. And I mean, I could go on and on about how oral historians talk about this, but it becomes a very strong argument that's accepted by some not accepted by others, but in some ways it mires oral history in a set of debates about whether it's a legitimate practice or not. That uh, set of debates um, runs into the 21st century uh, and it really kind of still encapsulates our moment of oral history in universities to a certain degree. So here's a quick summary of what's going on in our current moment and then I'm mean, gonna get into StoryCorps, right? 
Oral history stayed in the academy. It's still a big deal, though it's still in some ways marginalized. Students really like it. Intriguingly, oral history has been solidified in the mainstream American culture, and it's done that through family history and community history. That's represented through thousands of projects around this country that are archived in various places. But the one I want to point out is the Library of Congress's Veterans Oral History Project. Right? We've got these wonderful oral histories of World War II veterans, Vietnam veterans, and others that are a national treasure. And because they're a national treasure, and because ordinary people can do oral history, it's become kind of near and dear to American people's hearts, this practice of oral history. The mainstreaming of oral history has also become simpler because of digital technology. It's easier to take these oral histories. And by the way, I'm happy to talk about how to do it. Um, I, I do this with my students a lot. But likewise, a new set of really interesting challenges has, have emerged about the practice of oral history. And it goes back to this earlier debate. And it's this that I want to conclude with and to conclude with, with Jacob Rees. The debate is, well, what are we doing with oral history? Are we simply creating archives? I think that has value in its own right. Or following from Jacob Rees and the Highlander School, Septima Clark, Miles Horton, do we want an oral history practice that should be about change, about lifting up ordinary people's experiences and trying to make structural change, not just make connection, okay? And that's what the issue is with StoryCorps. Sometimes it feels like it's just an emotive connection that people can say, oh, that was such an incredible story, bye. I'm gonna leave that history behind me. I'm not worried about the structural issues that are behind that that made this person's life so difficult that you know, I'm not gonna try to change the insurance industry or healthcare, or I'm not gonna try to attack racism or whatever. I had a cool connection with them, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. That is encapsulated, for example, best I think for myself in what's called uh, the Cleveland uh, Homeless Oral History Project, where um, the practitioner, in that case, a man named Daniel Kerr, has argued for him, it's not about Alan Nevins and the archive. For him, it's about the Highlander School. And I think he would say Jacob Rees and, and change. Here it is, StoryCorps. This is one of the famous StoryCorps booths. This one is in Grand Central Station. You can go in, you record. Uh, sometimes there's someone there to help you, but it's designed to have two people kind of be able to record their own stories. These end up on NPR. They also end up on this major archive. They're very supported um, through corporate uh, support, foundations, that sort of stuff. And it's, and it's remarkable. They're really amazing stories. I mean, I have to say that they're really, really remarkable stories if you haven't heard them. And they're part of that documentary impulse. They're taking the documentary impulse to ordinary people, giving them the technology and the space to be able to do it and teaching them how to record each other's lives and they, re they create remarkable documentary. Here's another way they do it, right? This is the StoryCorps app. You can do your own right at home and then upload it to the StoryCorps archive and maybe NPR will select yours. Tons of school kids take, do this around the country. They create documentaries from it. They create podcasts. People's stories are incredibly valuable and important and interesting, right? And so folks have really connected the StoryCorps. This other picture is one of the mobile StoryCorps units and it's um, some family members recording each other's uh, memories and histories. Here's the uh, StoryCorps founder, Dave uh, Issei, talking about StoryCorps, right? He said that it is um, especially important now he argues that in response to a moment of intense political polarization, StoryCorps has gone out of its way to record people with opposite views, right? And get them to speak to each other about the tensions that they have between each other and their political perspectives or their social perspectives or whatever. So again, it's, it's an admirable thing, but does it get at what Reese wanted? Is this what Jacob Reese wanted for the documentary impulse? And is it what we should want? Alexander Freund, uh, in a remarkable article, as I've noted to you, says that we're under storytelling spell. We love the narrative. We love the connection. It's nostalgic. 
Often these stories long for simpler times, but they don't force us to confront the issues in our society in the way that Jacob Reese did. They don't force us to talk about policy and about real change. They just let us have kind of a sentimental moment or three minutes, if you're doing it on NPR, and to move away. What do you think? Okay, that's what I wanna ask you. How does StoryCorps fit with Reese's documentary impulse? This is my set of questions for you. How does it fit with the four paths, if you're interested in those, of the documentary impulse that emerged out of the Great Depression that I told you about? Should we want the documentary impulse to be about making change in whatever form, whether it's interviews, photographs, documentary films, whatever, or our own listening practices? And are the stories documenting people's lives important, do you believe, to making that change? Okay. Is the documentary impulse in its own right even valuable anymore in what is hopefully not, but might be a post-truth post moment? Okay, those are my questions for you. Thank you. I'm all done. Um, I just wanted to share some of that with you. I'm happy to talk about those questions. I'm going to bring them back up here in a second. I'm also happy to talk about anything else you're interested in. So with that, I'll turn it over to Diane and to your questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. That was yeah. very interesting. Um, we did have a question on the chat about thoughts on James Beard guided autobiography. Um, I have little to no idea what that is. So would the person tell me what the gu uh, guided autobiography is? Okay. Um, all right. I haven't heard it back yet. Um, there's also uh, comments about oral history is so valuable to professionals and the public. Um, someone else loved your quote. Oh, the Beeren Institute. Uh, she Beeren said. Institute. Okay. Um, I assume that this is a practice in which uh, one can learn how to do almost a self-interview, right? Uh, a life history, which is one of the wings of oral history, um, one that I've talked about with Studs Turkle, and that this helps you reflect on your own life as well as leave this um, for your kids or for your other relatives or for the nation, uh, our communities more broadly. Um, it sounds very cool to me. I love that practice. We do this, um, oral history projects are done in two different ways typically. One is a focused thematic project on a particular thing or we do life history. Um, one of my wonderful colleagues here at the University of Utah does life histories with folks in hospice. And this is incredibly meaningful to people. And it's part of the larger family history practice here in Utah that's so important. So I'm all for this. Does it make change? I don't know. Um, I'd be interested to, to hear your own views on how you believe family history ties in with our own sense of our larger society. Okay, and I think Emily might have had a question. Emily, did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, I probably just moved my hand around too much, but I thought the lecture was really great. And I think this question is very interesting because as a museum professional, like documenting and recording history is very much in line with this. And yeah. I think that's a question museums ask themselves too. Is it for a greater purpose or to inspire change or uh, there's a big movement that museums are not neutral. And I, I don't know if like oral histories are not neutral too, yeah. you know, like can it, I don't know. It's it, very, very interesting things to think about. Thanks, thanks for that. And you know, this whole question of self critique is really what the oral history field is all about right now, insofar as we often talk about shared authority. So uh, interviewers are very um, worried that they bend people's stories, right? or that they're asking a set of questions that the people that they're interviewing aren't really even interested in. Um, so how do we do something through shared authority? And how do we also understand the power dynamics between the interviewer and the interviewee, right? This is, I think, all things that museums are also wondering about. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments that you wanna make or, or answers to any of his questions? Okay, nothing's coming up on the chat at all. So, um, oh, go ahead. 
I just want to say what a great presentation. That's very kind of you. Thanks. Um, it's always fun to talk about this stuff, right? It's a really uh, subtle part of our society that maybe we don't reflect on very much, you know, things like StoryCorps and, uh, and this history that it's tied to. So uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I always like talking about it with my, with my students as well. Um, I take a bunch of oral histories with my students and as part of my own academic practice. Uh, and I should out myself. I think I'm pretty happy with these just being archival documents. But I do also hope that they make change. That's a mm -hmm. lot more effort, right? But most of the oral histories that are taken in America are in fact more archival documents. I wonder what Reese would think of that, right? I don't think he would be too critical, but I think he would want us to try to make change and to do that by documenting people's lives. Um, we had a couple of comments that they loved your presentation. They might, and someone might follow up with you. Um, I posted my uh, email on that final slide. Um, I'll put it back up there again. You're welcome to, to email me. Um, as I saw on Twitter, I'll either get back to you in 13 minutes or three weeks. Uh, it just depends on that particular email moment, but I will get back to you and, and hopefully it won't be three weeks. Um, <laughs> so grading awaits. So maybe it will be three weeks. <laughs> um, and someone else commented that they're a uh, lover of StoryCorps. And this ah, is great yeah. you do. It gives me a perspective in works that I am at work on. So. That's great. Yeah, I um, love the debate my students had about StoryCorps because they love it, many of them. And, and then when they read the article that was really quite critical of it, they were like, oh, geez. Um, so it, it's good to be introspective about this and also not to necessarily agree with a scholar. We're all very smart people. We get to make up our own minds, especially after we gather evidence and really think through a problem, right? Um, you know, we listen to a lot of different perspectives. We grapple with that evidence and we make up our own mind on what we think. Um, anyone else have any questions or comments for Matt or for everybody? No. Well, Matt, I want to thank you. Um, My pleasure. Uh, thanks everybody for, for coming out uh, and listening. Um, I think for your viewing pleasure, uh, because it's such a dynamic uh, performance, it'll be available on YouTube. Uh, I assume it'll have at least uh, what my kids my kids follow YouTubers that have about ten million downloads. Uh, so I think we'll are we shooting for about four or five, Diane? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thanks, everybody. Um, much appreciated your attention and patience. And thank you all for coming. And please feel free to come and see our exhibit on Jacob Rees. It'll be up till January seventh. So um, it's, it's very interesting. So, and thanks again. And have a great holiday season if we don't talk to you. So, bye everybody. Bye everybody. Matt, thank you again. I appreciate it. My pleasure.